is it informal? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was aware of it, yes. Uh, so I'm Heather Langenkamp. I can say those. And uh, we were in Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3, Dream Warriors, together. Many years ago. And I was in, I was in Nightmare in the original. And then Wes Queen. Does anyone have a question or want to? I don't know what you want to talk about. If this is the first time that I've ever had this going on, you know, you've been talking. But you're the gentleman. You have to know we'll start off. Well, let's talk about. Okay, ladies. So, Nightmare on Ocean Country. How many is that their favorite of all the ones that they've been watching? The best one. And Chuck Russell was the director. Yeah. Co-star Patricia Arquette yeah. played Kristen, and then I play the you know, psycho psychologist or PhD student who has all the answers to these poor kids. I, I saw uh, you know when I first did Nightmare on Me, I was <coughs> scared. My mother was like, she was literally very the big sister. Of us. She really protected us. Newcomers on the screen. She didn't let nobody mess with her. <laughs> I don't know if he's just doing it, but she, she would not get it. I remember one time. Oh, that's was, I wasn't that much older than you were, though, but I'd had other experiences with the movie, so I knew what to expect. And It's really hard to make a horror movie. It's it's grueling, and we had, a, I thought, a really hard time with that. We had terrible sets that were not very hospitable. Remember, we all had little cots that they... <laughs> yeah. Our dressing rooms were... Really dismal. Yeah, and, uh, and I had this big fantasy that when you do the movies, you got this big dress room, and I went in and I said, <laughs> 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 it, was, it was so bad. I don't think I went one time. Yeah. Though it, was a, it was like a cell. It was very much like a little prison. Yeah. And it was a cell with an army cop. And that was it. That was our dressing yeah. room. And, uh, I have to say, of all the nightmares that I've worked on, the conditions in that were the worst by far. <laughs> the food was the worst, the dressing rooms were the worst. And then all these kids are in their their first experience making a movie, and I really did feel bad for them because I felt like, you know, and, and they all deserved a little bit better than yeah. that. But also, you know, for me, you know, it was sometimes cruel, you know, not wrong to it because of the stress that they were in. They had. They would. They would talk to us in a different way, and she would stand up and say, "Don't talk to them like that." So we couldn't say anything. Oh, <laughs> that's sweet. I don't remember doing yeah, that. I, but I it remember sounds like, well. Sounds like something I remember well. <laughs> <laughs> I remember well. So. Well, I think that you know when you have people that aren't as experienced, they don't have a lot of the. Um, they haven't learned a lot of the conventions that you learn as an actor, like how to you know, doing rehearsals, standing on your marks so that they can get the focus. Things that are really important for the crew, but no one ever gives you a, a like a how-to book of how to be an actor on a movie yeah. set. And so it does involve, like I actually remember, I'd only been on one movie when I did Nightmare on Elm Street Part One, but I had learned a lot. And you don't scream really loud in the rehearsal because the sound man might not have his you know, his earphones turned down, and if you're going to scream, you've got to let them know. Like, all these things you would never know to do until you make the mistake of blowing out a sound man's ears because you didn't tell him that you were going to use full volume. And, um, so these kids all come onto the set, and pretty much everybody it was their first job. But it was, uh, for me, it wasn't my first job, but what I had come from stage, you know, and the stage you were taught to. Check you and talk loud, and I had just finished a movie with, with Denzel. Oh, great! And Denzel, and you know, and so he had told me the same thing. And I, but I had never did uh, <coughs> acting, which was you know that rough and tough rough stuff. And tough. Yeah. So I was really rough and tough, and it was Lawrence Larry Fishburne at the time. Lawrence Fishburne took me to the side, and he didn't take me <laughs> to the side. He said, "Look." And they're gonna be throwing me up and down this damn <laughs> <laughs> So he 
you just said, just act like you're moving. Don't act like you're trying to get a nut. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that so sweet? I mean, that's yeah. the thing is that uh, there are some actors that will do that, and then there's others that don't. And, yeah. and I do think, well, working with yeah, Larry Fishburne. Wow. So, he was so, great so it was like a little harvest for me. Mm -hmm. I was learning new things as I went along. I mean, Elvin was there for me, Robert Ingram was there. You know, they, they, they helped us, you know, for me as a young new person to the screen. So, uh, so I had three people that was helping us. As far as a lot of people ask about Nightmare, what was the relationship between all of us? Well, Chuck Russell, he got all the uh, kids together. I think it was a week before we film. And so we became friends. And one of the first scenes that we shot was at the hospital scene. Right. So we were, we didn't just come to the set and not know each other. We knew each other. We were friends. So a lot of that helped a lot because we really was helping each other throughout the film. Does anyone have any questions or anything you'd like to know about? Yeah. Um, if you guys did a reboot that didn't suck, um, <laughs> <laughs> would you, like, now you're in fantasy world, <laughs> <laughs> would you, like, go back, like, if you guys got, you know, resurrected, would you, you know, start it up and be your characters again and all that? I could do, I could reprise my character really easily. I mean, yeah. you could reprise your character. No, I'm fat now. What are they going to say? You need to go to jail, <laughs>
be making stuff up. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Which made you stay yeah. on board as an actor. You know, you had to be able to say the line if it makes sense, you know. But one of the things that Chuck Russell allowed me to do in a couple of them, he, he was saying, uh, Kenny, say what a black guy. Say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said, okay, I can do that. <laughs> so, but I, Isn't that how fucking A came out? <laughs> you, know, you, know, you, know, you know, we never talked about this here, Justin. Now we can get that to talk. Is that when they, I did not know what fucking A meant. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't. We no, I was asking him, what I said, what, what is fucking A? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, and I kept asking, he said, kept telling me, trust me, it's going to work. And I was like, what's an A? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> ask him, if you ever see him, ask him. I, did not, I had never heard that phrase before. I was fucking south. Right, they don't say that. No. But it turned out, and this is why you trust your writer, you trust your director. Because I, I, I knew it. If we had trusted Ken, it would have been. <laughs> 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 yeah, what are we talking about? I did not know what that was. I was in my walk. I've been too long to write on your photos, too. I like, if you get Ken, like, his autograph, he writes, fucking A. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> I, I didn't know because, hey, because they asked me. Uh, oh, they asked you to write that? No, they just... It's become I, your tagline, though. It's, it's my become, tagline. It's your tagline. You know, and so, and it's easy. <laughs> you don't have to have good grammar. Oh, <laughs> oh, it's fun to have a tagline, though. Yeah. You know? It's fun to have a tagline. Yeah. Yes, sir. What was your audition process for you for the first one? And after that? Well, for the first one, it was a, it was a pretty open call, I think. Uh, in the olden days, the agents would get the information through this thing called a breakdown. And I think they were actually delivered. I mean, in the olden days before the internet, um, you know, they, everything was manually done. And so they would see, oh, they need a young girl who can play Christine, be wholesome, whatever that description was. I don't know what it was, but my agent submitted me for it. And then I went in, and it was, you know, independent feature film in the days when there weren't that many. I mean, it was in a really bad area of Hollywood, I remember, and you always are worried about where you're gonna park, and put your, <laughs> your low jack on your steering wheel, and you're just like, oh, I don't know, my car's there, I wanna get back. And then got into the, the room, it was Annette, um, Annette Benson, Annette Benson, and, um, there was no chairs. There was not any furniture in the room. There was just a kind of a girl with a clipboard and handing off the sides. And so I sat on the floor and went over them and went in for Annette. <coughs> and she obviously liked me. So she said, I'm going to bring you in in a couple of days to meet Wes Craven. I said, great. And um, there were a lot of people there. A dozen people reading for Everyone read for Nancy. And then the next day that I came in, there were more people and they were pairing Nancy and Tina's up. Like, you either got in the Nancy pile or the Tina pile, I guess, depending <laughs> on how you read the part. And so I read with Amanda Wiss and we went in for Wes Craven sitting there. And we did the scene where we're sitting on the couch and, and she says, you had the same dream I did last night. And we got along great. And uh, I remember going, <laughs> like that with my fingers and the audition and after we were done reading Wes was like congratulations I'm going to hire you guys for this movie and um, if, if there's a book out there on the table next to where I am called Never Sleep Again the history of Elm Street movie or whatever right. but um, Tommy Hudson is here I think he sold out his last book just now though but he's putting it out in paperback but there's you can see my I gave him my um, daily like a planner from that couple of months of time and I said, you know, put whatever you want in there. So you see in my daily planner, I got it like with an exclamation point. <laughs> and uh, and then you can see I had like rehearsals and then I had I invited Johnny over one day so we could go 
go and just hang out and we went to the Griffith Park Observatory and um, it was cool. We decided we wanted to go to some place that had a lot of film history and uh, we thought of, you know, he was so much like James Dean in the way he, he was, just so quiet, very shy, very reserved. And so I thought, oh, let's go to Griffith Park and I'll pretend I'm Natalie Wood. He's James Dean. And we just walked around and, um, yeah, it was never romantic, unfortunately, between me and Johnny because he had, <laughs> he had a, uh, either a wife or girlfriend and I had a very serious boyfriend. So we were always very, um, you know, above board and we liked it that way. It was easier to, it adds a lot of complexity when you have a romantic feeling to your co-star, I think. It makes it hard to work. And, I know when we were working with all the kids, there was a Peyton place, like, <laughs> Rodney had crushes yeah. on every girl, and yeah. every girl was like, I couldn't tell. It was like, every morning there was gonna be a new drama. Every, someone's heart was gonna be broken. Yeah. And, um, anyway, but that was the audition process for me. It was, it was relatively easy, I have to say. The other projects I've been involved with, the process is just so, so so horrible. <laughs> <laughs> now, for me, the short version is that I had never watched the night on the street. I never didn't know what it was. And, you know, the break, like she said, the breakdown, the breakdown, my agent called me and he described the Kim K as a 29 inch waist, nice feel guy, and I kept looking at myself and said, why the hell are you sending me out? <laughs> so, but it just happened to have been a day that it was raining. I had to go to court for traffic tickets. <laughs> <laughs> I had to catch the bus, and you know, and downtown LA Wagner Courthouse was here. Where the audition was here, so I and I did not want to go. I just he and he insisted I went, so I went. I had time everything out to catch the bus so I get to this audition because I know I'm not going to get it. And I just go up there and I knew what time the bus would take it home. So I went, raining, went up there, and it was like, it was a black guy in Hollywood. One that been rolled for us, and they were just up there walking in there, you know, and I, was, and I just didn't have a chance. So I had a serious attitude. And I went in, just, you know, he asked me, how you doing? Okay. So I had you know, so you were just I had an ad, I didn't want to be there. And you know, he just said that, well, did you read the script? No. <laughs> 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 you know, and, and so it, it, it's tough because I had such an attitude and he thought That's what he was looking for, right? And he thought I was acting. <laughs> 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 so he, he told me just let go and just do whatever you want to do. And it was a lot of books and then I said, really? And so I cussed him out and told him shut up. And so I Did you really? Ask him. <laughs> I mean, I don't mean that task stuff up, but you know, I was kind of. You pushed stuff around. Yes. Yeah. I was getting off some steam. Look, I'm up here. It's raining. And I the bus. the bus. Two hours. You know. And, and then he, and he said, thank you. And I went home. And when I got home, Agent was called in. We didn't have cell phones then, so the agent had been calling and calling, and I pick up the yeah. phone, and he said, What the hell did you do? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I told you not to send me, and he said, You got the fucking wall. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I remember going to see part four when I was a kid, probably way too young to see it. Um, and I remember when it started, 
thinking, well, that's not Kristen. I mean, I remember the kid not realizing like actresses and stuff, but like, that's not Kristen. So as an adult, like, um, who did you prefer working with between Patricia Arquette and Tuesday night? What were the biggest differences? This is being taped. <laughs> okay. Sorry, can't go there. I, I will say this here is that, you know, I think both of them brought their own acting abilities to it. So for me, I think uh, Patricia Arquette did a great job, a wonderful job as Christian. But I think Tuesday came in and she worked her behind off to make her role her. So as an actor, I went there and I worked with the person who was playing Christian. I didn't get into that. I, I made, through my life, I made a point. I don't get into that. So. There, you couldn't pick two different, more different girl women. They're both so different, too. That's kind of a great idea, I thought, because then each actress has a chance to put her own mark on it. If they had tried to find two people or a girl who was just like Patricia, I think it would have been harder to be a co-star with that one. I wasn't in the script long enough. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, there's a hand back there. Oh, hey, okay. Scott. So, piggybacking off of this guy's question about Freddie's one-liners, um, when I saw Nightmare on Elm Street 3, I thought it was great. The special effects are great. The story was great. Um, but it did sort of become the beginning of Freddy becoming this comical character. And I wanted to know what you guys felt about that. Well, a lot of people died, you know. I think it's also the start of Freddy having, having multiple, like a lot of victims, too. And so Nightmare, you know, he had three victims. And then Nightmare. There's only like two or three. Yeah, there's only two or three there too. But so this one, there was what six or seven victims or potential victims, and so I think in order to differentiate each killing, because what was new about Freddy is that they did differentiate between the killings. So you're now known as the guy who died with this one liner, and and then you're the girl who died with this one liner. So it became a way of differentiating the which I think is a great idea because one of the things I don't like about horror is they all kind of just blend in together after a while. And I mean, some movies, like the girl, like one is a blonde and one is a brunette, like we're supposed to remember the difference. But I think starting with Freddy, it just, they, they each had a real personality, each death, and that was Robert Richard. Well, they decided to yeah. deliver these lines. I mean, it becomes a little gimmicky after a while, but Nightmare 3, I think, is and I think if you look at it is that um, Rob Freddy for the first time was challenged. And I think that's like when you if anybody go and challenge somebody in their field, it's like hope the kids want to play. Mm -hmm. And so and I think if you look at it from that point of view, he brought in levels because we were the first group that really wanted to challenge him back. And then that Freddy versus the Dream Warriors, that brought in a new dimension, you know, and it brought in, I think it brought in comedy, it brought in drama, it brought in suspense, it brought in horror. The wonderful thing about three is that it brought in everything. So old and young could watch it, it was a little bit of a touch of this, a touch of that, and everything. So I think that is one of the things that made it work, you know. Um, and when they were able to make more sequels, yeah. Because unless you revitalize kind of your your storyline with Freddy, it had to be energized. Yeah. And uh, I think that the one-liners energized it. Yeah. And uh, luckily, Robert is a, a very funny guy, so it was natural too. It wasn't. A lot of times you have these, even you know, like uh, "I'll be back," you know, which is a great line. When he t repeats it in the future, I mean, as recent. It didn't have that authenticity that it did back then, and I right. thought, you know, he's a different guy now, you know? And uh, having a one-liner isn't always gonna save the day, you realize that. You have to have a one-liner that also kind of matches who the person is and who the character is, and it so much has to go in, like, make my day, of course, then that is a one-line that will live you know, forever. So 
I think Robert's really aware of that. Like each line has to have that that rock solid intensity and authenticity to make sense. And, and Robert was not he's not and uh, he was not a selfish actor. What I mean by that, he was not an actor that wanted all the glory. He allowed each one of us to have our moment. And if necessary, he would set up the moment for us. Right, he did that a lot. He did that a lot. He put you in a good spot. Yeah. And he would um, he would suggest to the yeah. director, you know, I think this would be good if I'm doing this with yeah. him there, the camera there. And because it was Chuck Russell's first movie. Yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't that experience and had a stage for, as you can tell from all the seating, <laughs> sitting down scenes. So that's my least favorite part of the movie is you have all these kids that are these, you know, great energies and we're all sitting down all the time. And I was like, Chuck, we've got to get on our feet. You know, I know we're in a you know, mental hospital, but we have to be sitting down for every scene. <laughs> so she could say oh. that. I could do that. <laughs> I know. Well, there's a scene with Patricia and I, and, uh, with Patricia and me, and I thought, oh, this will be one where we can both stand up. You know, we can, I can move around the room, and we can, like, I can pick up, you know, a paperweight or something and do something exciting. <laughs> and then he's like, okay, Patricia, you're going to be sitting here, and then Heather, you're going to come in and sit down there. I'm like, wait a minute, I don't want to sit down again. <laughs> and Nancy's such an active character, that's why I mean, I'm very rarely sitting down in Night Round on the Street, uh, part one, very rarely. And I think that it, it's, like, part of who she is that she does not sit down. And... And those kinds of subtle body language things in film are really important. And I wanted to tell Chuck that over and over again, that you know, Nancy's a character of action. She just can't be sitting down. And, uh, but he didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> yes, did, sir. Did you get to be in the room in the first movie that just to mess around in? The rotating room? The rotating room. I did not. That's a good question. I've never, I never was able to be in that room. I wish I had, but I did watch the, um, I did watch it carefully when it was happening, and uh, it was incredible. It was, it was just magical watching it in real life. It was a big room. I mean, it was, a, it was this tall, but it's also on, uh, call it like a pin, you know, rotating. So um, it was a massive structure. And uh, it had um, outside of the room, it had places to push the room so that the grips could push it and move it, you know, in a turn over on itself. So it was pretty magnificent. And of course, they pushed it the wrong way, which was a big problem in that scene because the blood was supposed to, a Johnny scene, the blood was to come out of the bed and splash down the wall. And the grips pushed it the wrong way. And so it wall you don't see is an open wall where everyone crawls in and out and get into the room. So they pushed it the wrong way so all the blood went out that empty wall onto everybody standing there. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, they only could do it once. This is a one-time shot. So um, Wes got that film. We looked at it the next day and Daly's and he, you know, he's a genius. He says, we'll make that work. And um, so you'll notice in the sound effects, it's like a wind, like this mystery wind that's blowing the blood completely out of the room and you don't even see the blood dripping. So it was so freaky that way, right? If it had been the other way, it'd been like every other horror movie, and, you know, too much blood. So. Yes, ma'am? <laughs> uh, 